Remarkable acknowledges the traditional custodians of the lands on which we are gathered today. This is their land, never ceded, always sacred. And we pay respects to the elders past, present and emerging, for they hold the traditions, the culture and the hopes of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples across the nation. We acknowledge and respect their continuing culture and the remarkable contribution they make to Australian life. And we would also like to acknowledge the advocates who have played a role in advancing the rights of people with disability, leading to address the inequalities faced by people with disability. They have paved the way for us. We carry a privilege and a responsibility because of that history. We are better together. Just outside of New York, the term disability economy is making its way across the globe. And this is thanks to the brilliant work of Professor Jonathan Kaufman. Born with cerebral palsy, Jonathan's disability has been a profound part of his personal, academic and professional life. And it's also how he ended up as the former policy advisor to the White House on diversity and disability and with a column in Forbes magazine. In the following conversation, we dive into the brilliant mind of Jonathan, unpacking the concept of the disability economy and what this means for the future of the tech industry. Jonathan, thank you so much for coming. Um, but to start off, I'd love if you wouldn't mind doing a visual description of yourself um, because this will be a um, video podcast as well. So if you wouldn't mind just describing um, what you look like in your setting, that would be wonderful. Sure. Um, you know, at this point, I, I must say, I am now a middle-aged um, sort of, I guess, Caucasian man, you know, sort of, I used to have cur very curly hair, but, you know, wavy hair, glasses, wearing a black t-shirt as I normally do. This is sort of my normal uniform, black t-shirts and, je and jeans are sort of my favorite um, and slightly scruffy, but it's morning time. So I think it's always scruffy. Um, yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. And I, I suppose I'll, I'll go ahead. I'm Viv. <laughs> I've got very fair skin and long, dark brown hair, and I always seem to be sporting red lipstick. I think it just makes me feel more awake. Um, but I am so excited to jump into this conversation with you today. You've mentioned uh, when we spoke earlier that your your disability has sort of coloured your life in a way and, and the trajectory that you went on from a young age. Would you mind speaking to that? No, I, I talk about it all the time. I mean, I was born what they call, the sort of medical terminology is I was born with a right hemiparesis a form of cerebral palsy. And so in, in sort of layman's terms, it means that essentially it's really the left side of my body that works fully. The right side is debatable. And I always think of myself as having two sides. And we call, well, in my house, my, the right side of my body is called Bob. And Bob has a personality of his own. And Bob decides, you know, when he's spastic, I mean, my significant other always, she always says, I know when you're angry because Bob never lies. <laughs> he sort of takes a mind of his own and has his own personality. So, yes, I live with another person um, that I deal with every day. So uh, it's OK. I mean, and the truth of the matter is I've learned to deal with it, but it's given me a tremendous amount of gifts, I think. Um, I think my disability is my gift in so, in so many ways. Um, it's it's been up and down. There's been moments when you're sort of thinking about, OK, how do I live day to day when you're in significant amount of pain? And I use humor a lot to, to, to hide it. But I always think that that's something that's good. I understand, OK, where is my place and being able to evolve and actually being able to innovate, because the fact of the matter is the world like for many people with different types of disabilities, the world wasn't designed for us. So we have to figure out, okay, how do we reframe it so that we can, I think, navigate through it. You've identified as a professional stranger. What exactly, do, what do you mean by that? Um, and how does that relate to the businesses that you run? I mean, I think part of it, it, it comes from my, part of my training, my doctoral work was in anthropology. Uh, a PG in applied anthropology. And so anthropologists have had a saying that they call themselves the professional strangers in the sense that they enter a culture that they're not from 
that that's sort of a foreign culture and they study it they scrutinize it they look at it and so in many ways they think of themselves as strangers in a strange land and i always say to myself well in the work that i do whether as as a psychotherapist whether as a consultant or an executive coach or a strategist I am that professional stranger. I'm coming into an organization or a place or an institution where I don't know them intimately yet, but it is entering that environment as a stranger and hopefully become their friend. There's this one story that I love, which is when you were um, you had a surprise lecturer at, at your university. Um, can you share a bit about how, how that, that all unfolded? I, I went, I, part of my graduate work was at the University of Chicago, and um, uh, that sort of changed the trajectory of my professional life, I would say, um, because one of my professors happened to be Barack Obama. Before he was Senator Barack Obama, before he was President of the United States, and, and you know, it absolutely sort of shaped my career, because I always thought I would be a full-time academic, um, at least I thought. Um, and then when I was taking classes with him, it sort of changed the trajectory of how I thought where my life would go. And really what changed was subsequent to that. Um, I knew him and then I went on to Columbia University in New York um, and then he was running for president and all my friends who we knew him or knew him um, said, he's running. And do you want to be a part of this? And uh, s- subsequently sort of sur- sort of a circuitous route, um, I had heard he was going to create the first um, advisor to the president on disability policy. And lo and behold, I get a call. But the thing was, is I lived in Los Angeles at the time. I wasn't living close. And so I said, yes. And so what ended up happening was, is that I helped design the policies and the programs and helped train the the person who was actually on sort of, I guess, on location um, in the White House around disability policy and politics. And I had a variety of different verticals and different portfolios within the U.S. government. But I was flying back and forth from Los Angeles to Washington, D.C. once a month. I was on the phone every day at 4 a.m. in the morning, at 3 a.m. in the morning, because it's a three-hour difference um, from Los Angeles to D.C. Um, and it was an incredible experience. Um, and what's actually even more interesting is that I was on a medical ethics committee at the University of Chicago hospitals with Michelle Obama, who I think is even more fascinating than he is. I mean, he's a great guy and he was a wonderful professor, but she was really interesting. And just to sort of be with her and get to know how her brain worked and her mind worked um, was really interesting. So I got to know the, the Obama family. I mean, this is going back a ways into the sort of nine, the, you know, mid to late nineties. Wow! And and what do you, when you're talking about Michelle, it sounds like you you had a um, you got to know her in a in a really special way. What is it that that was so impressive about her that perhaps other people wouldn't know? Well, I, I mean, I think people know she was smart as a whip. Mm. I mean, that's the one thing. But she was. Um, she had this way, because it was a medical ethics committee, she had this level of empathy that was extraordinary. I mean, I think anybody who is on a medical ethics committee really has to have that. Um, but it was interesting in terms of her way of negotiating with people and, and seeing the way that she connected with human beings was was great. And what it also taught me, I think that experience and being able to have time in the White House was, you know, I had a great teacher in this in my father. My father was both a a practicing physician but a professor of medicine. And he always used to tell me, and he still tells me to this day, is, you know, if you could be the sort of scholar practitioner in the sense of you could do both. You can be sort of have that academic side, but also be a practitioner. And that's why I think for my when I went further on into graduate school as I did applied work applied anthropology, the application. And I think in terms of 
the disability work that I do, the DNI work that I do, it's always okay. So taking the knowledge, this is sort of academic, maybe sort of highfalutin stuff, and saying, okay, how does it apply to day to day life? Because that's really when the rubber meets the road, what the value proposition is. What when it comes to policy change, um, sort of, what are the red flags that you see as being sort of the barriers to this to this change? Is it majority vote? Is it um, just a lack of awareness or is it division between parties? What, do, what are the real roadblocks? I, I, I think initially it is lack of awareness initially. Um, politics do play a role in it. We're sort of in this funky time globally in, in terms of our political discourse. Um, but I think that initially it's understanding. It's that we really are that different from one another. And specifically when you're talking about the disability space is that, look, this is the largest minority on earth and it's, it's diverse in nature, which makes it really unique. It runs across three. I always tell my clients and my students, disability is, is the essence of diversity. It runs across race, ethnicity, gender, socioeconomic, sexual orientation. And it's the only minority group anyone can join at any time, whether you're a visitor passing through or whether you're a permanent resident. Um, Or it's the fact that not only is this something that's important as far as from a from a sort of DNI standpoint, but the value proposition of the community itself impacts everyone. If we're lucky enough to age, we all join this community. This is an inclusive community by design and that it benefits everyone. If you think about it from the perspective of, well, we really have to take people with disabilities, with all types of disabilities, and their narrative into our design processes, whether it be a product or a service or a policy. Specifically from the point of view of people that have acquired disabilities, how have you seen any sort of trends in your DNI work where you've had to, um, you know, th- th- there's been people that were employed and then they acquired disabilities and, and then all of a sudden employment becomes trickier and perceptions change um, for what are just really awful stereotypes and misconceptions about disability that we didn't judge someone on prior to acquiring a disability. I, I suppose I'm just, how does that feed into the work that you do? I mean, I think it feeds into the narrative perfectly because I think that the, the one sort of idea that that's prevalent is I always say is the F word, fear. Fear drives that narrative all the time. It's, it's the fear of the unknown. And and this isn't just disability, but it is related to it. It's the sense of we don't know. And because we don't know, we fear it rather than saying, okay, let's get to know it. Let's get to understand it better so that we can embrace it and say, okay, what do we need as an organization, as an institution to do about it? How do we think about it as, as this isn't about a policy issue as much as it's or even a legal issue, which it's sort of all mired in at times, but it's really about a design issue. And, you know, it's fascinating in sort of the age of COVID, and we're going to be living with COVID. When COVID isn't done. COVID is with us forever. But the silver lining of all of this is that it, it was it sort of it was an accelerant in the sense that it accelerated the idea of a hybrid workforce of the idea of changing the culture of work. And we needed that accelerant, unfortunately, or fortunately, whichever way you sort of look at it. But we needed the accelerant to say, all right, we are now working in a very new time. And yes, there would be some times when you're sort of in office. There's some times when you're in out. Now, how does that change the narrative of people with disabilities? It allows them that allows people with many different types of disabilities to engage in employment. So what you can do is you can say, okay, us is whether it's in the DNI, you know, diversity and inclusion, the chief diversity officer and their team, whether it's in the talent management side or the HR side, to say, okay, we understand that this is now a reality. 
what one, there are two sides to this. One, what do we learn from this community? You know, in terms of needs, in terms of design processes, also the ability to say we can get the best and the brightest. And if they're working from home, for example, or we have sort of accommodations or design tweaks, we can then get people with disabilities involved in the organization at a much faster rate. And I think that, that, that there's a lot of, this is sort of rife for opportunity. Have you seen, um, I suppose, talking pre-COVID, post-COVID, during COVID, I don't think this post-COVID exists, um, have, have you seen a, a, an attitude shift towards people leaning into the knowledge that the disability community has um, about how to be innovative in a situation like this? Um, I think I think so. I think slowly but surely. I think if, if you're talking about sort of millennials and Gen Zers, certainly there is a push towards that. Um, and I think this is, I, I think, unfortunately, the, um, the, the amount of time that's passed, we're looking at a small sample size right now. And so we need more time to digest all of this. But I do see change, and I certainly am pushing for it. And I think one of the other sort of major pieces, aside from that, is the metaverse. Is one, there's a couple of things. The metaverse has to be accessible. You know, the accessibility, I think, is such a big part of the technology now that we're sort of pushing in, whether in any, whether it's high tech or low tech, you know, um, and what I mean by low tech is essentially curb cuts are a form of accessibility. It was designed originally for people who had strollers, but, you know, actually it was originally that other way around. But in terms of the usage it could be used for a variety of things outside of just people with wheelchairs. Um, so the idea of accessibility is about the ability to navigate through the world in a way which is designed easier for everyone. And so the benefit is beneficial to all, I mean, sort of all people. And so the idea is to say, we need to think about what can we learn from people with disabilities who've had to navigate the world, you know, for ages, I mean, throughout history, and realize that the world wasn't designed for them. So we have to re rethink how we design for this new environment, for this new work environment. And that I think is important. But I also think the idea now that people with disabilities can contribute a lot more to the work environment than they've had before. So it is changing. I certainly am seeing, um, you know, people making overtures to particularly companies making overtures to saying, okay, we have to double down on our DNI because we want, we want the best and the brightest. We want that diverse group of thinking. We want to have a competitive advantage. And what does that really look like? What does a competitive advantage look like? They're not doing this for nothing. I mean, nobody would, I would, I'm under no illusion that they're doing this, oh, because this is really wonderful. Yeah, there's certainly some of that, but there's a, there's a, there's a cost benefit to this. And it's a cost benefit for people with disabilities who want to work, who want to continue to work, or people who are aging, who are saying, okay, you know what? Retirement isn't for me. I want to sort of take the next step. But I'm dealing with health issues, but my brain works and I can continue to work. That's going to be a very interesting question, I think, as particularly baby boomers start to retire or reimagine what's the sort of next step, the encore of their lives and dealing with, again, disabilities and particularly those that are at the C-suite who are saying, you know what, maybe I don't want to retire. Maybe I want to do something else. And to reimagine <clears throat> what the world of work looks like, that in itself will have a trickle down effect. Could you sort of speak to the current climate of what this the, the economy of, of or the disability market looks like? Yeah, I mean, I call it the disability economy. And when I always think about the disability economy, it's 
it's vibrant, it's diverse, it's it's engaging. And what makes it unique? I mean, when you look at the market, you ask that question. So the market itself is larger than the, the disability community as we know it today is larger than the size of China. It's about 1.8 1.8, 1.85 billion people. It's an enormous number. So when you have, you know, let's say you have in terms of population, China, India, somewhere in there, but if you have a country, um, and then you're looking at the, in terms of the market itself, in terms of US dollars, it's anywhere between eight and $13 trillion. And so, and then if you look at the different verticals, for example, um, the adaptive fashion market, you know, Vogue Business sort of wrote a piece, this is about a year ago now, saying that it that market itself currently was a $400 billion market and is ex- expected to grow in the coming years. So companies are now, in particular, you know, are saying, okay, we have to reassess this. We have to reassess because like any organization, they're like, you know, they're like sharks. If you don't keep moving, don't keep innovating, you don't survive. So you have to say, okay, well, what gives us a competitive advantage? We have to understand what the marketplace is. Now, on the flip side of that, what's great is there are young entrepreneurs out there. There are young inventors who are thinking, okay, well, and these are our inventors who are allies, people with disabilities, and saying, we think this marketplace is really great. So we, and and now you can go to any sort of vertical, travel, fashion, um, different products and services, um, and see products and services and around the disability economy, around the disability space. And it's sort of continually growing. I mean, I think the only limitation is one's imagination at this point, and that's what it should be. And um, I think it's important to sort of foster that, whether it's internally at a very large company um, to say, how do we look at our products and services that we already have and how does it connect to this market? What new products and services do we have to, to, to sort of develop to smaller companies Um, young entrepreneurs who are developing amazing stuff and saying, where are you? I mean, in many ways, it's no different than what happened, you know, I guess if you go back to the, to the boom in Silicon Valley, I mean, but it's everywhere now, now it's global. This is a global um, endeavor and it should be because it benefits the human experience. I think the disability experience benefits the human experience. It goes hand in hand. And I suppose what's what's interesting is that it is it is a massive market now. Um, but in many ways it, it sort of always has been if we look at the technology that is ubiquitous in our life, you know, today, it, a lot of it was originally born from um, – a need inspired by those with disabilities, um, you know, things like like SMS, which is or, or texting. Um, c- can you think of any other examples of, of that sort of technology that is ubiquitous with our day to day lives that people probably don't or perhaps don't know about? Yeah, I mean, we cert- you certainly mentioned texting. We talked about that the other day, and I, and I always bring that up because that. And then, and I think that's a sort of perfect example is that in 1976 at Gallaudet University in Washington, D.C., and Gallaudet was known for it's like the preeminent um, university for, for deaf and hard of hearing. But, but, and it's like the sort of bastion for deaf culture. So their idea was how do we communicate with one another? And, you know, the idea of cell phones was in its nascent stages. Um, and texting became a part of even before the advent of cell phones, but it was ado- it was adapted for that reason. And I think that that was such an important, and then everybody used it. I mean, you can't, I don't think there's anybody who doesn't know that. But even something as simple as what I'm wearing, glasses, you know, the, fa- the advent of glasses in itself. I always tell people when I give a speech, I said, how many of you out there think you have a disability? I said, 
no, you know, somebody, there are people who raise their hand. I said, how many of you have glass, how many of you take your glasses off for a moment? Can you see? And they're like, no. So you have to look at glasses themselves as an adaptive tool. It's as simple as that. You could, or, or if you're thinking about it from the perspective of, um, you know, if we all use adaptive tools in some way, shape, or form. It doesn't matter who we are. It's part of the human, it's part of the human condition, actually. I think to use adaptive tools, we can use forks and knives. Those are adaptive tools. So if we're looking at the history of design in any capacity, human beings have used adaptive tools, whether if you were hunters and gatherers, we were using adaptive tools from the very beginning to live a better quality of life. So what's the difference today? Mm. Nothing. But in one of my driving forces is to build the disability economy. I think once private equity and, I, and I, you know, once money is put into it and said, OK, we're going to validate you as entrepreneurs, as business people, it validates the idea that, ah, this is a, this is a community that has value. I mean, I think and look, I am not I, I want to make this very clear, I think. Advocacy has been exceedingly important and it needs to continue. But I also think now it has to merge with other areas. And it is, and employment certainly is one of those. But it's, it's the design and thinking of how do we create a new world? You know, when in Silicon Valley in the 1960s and early 1970s, when they sort of came, it was almost like the California gold rush of 18, the 1849 and saying, okay, how do we, how do we think about our riches? Now you could say, okay, that Silicon Valley model is, is global. I don't care where you are. I mean, you could be on the Gulf coast of Australia. You could be on, you could be in Paris. You could be in London. You could be in Dubai. You could be in India. I mean, it doesn't really matter where you are as long as you have a good idea and you can execute it because execution is going to be the prime directive now is how do we execute that? Where are the resources available to nurture young minds that are coming up? People, and not only young minds, people that are saying, ah, I have an idea. I don't think it matters how old or how young. I mean, you look at, look, I always think about Kentucky Fried Chicken. You know, Colonel Sanders who created it, he was 65 years of age when he said, I have this idea. And then he built this sort of multi-million dollar, multi-billion dollar franchise. I don't think age matters. I think ideas matter. And I think that's the most important thing is to say, I have an idea. I want to execute it. I want to nurture it. How do I let it grow? So there is an ecosystem that needs to be designed. I mean, what I love about what Remarkable is doing is that they are helping to really shape an ecosystem that needs to be developed. Now there has to be capital that's put in. And I think there has to be even some successes because I think being able to see, look, like anything, there will be failures. But I think what failures are, are a teaching moment and saying, what do we learn from failure? What do we learn from this? And saying, okay, how do we iterate? One of the things you learn from, and particularly, I mean, I can speak for myself, but I can speak for other people who've told me is the disability, the idea of the disability experience, the idea of the disability narrative is, is about design and it's about iteration and it's about failure. And what do we learn from failure and how do we have to rethink how we navigate the world? That in itself lends itself so perfectly to entrepreneurship. I think that, that people with disabilities in all forms, and when you sort of look at the data, you look at all of these, you know, f very successful entrepreneurs and CEOs. Many of them have learning disabilities. Many of them have some type of disability. And the studies have been done and continue to be done that you realize that lived experience is invaluable and needs to continue to be fostered and needs to continue to be talked about so that it becomes commonplace. This this driving force of nothing about us without us has been 
huge in the disability advocacy space and really paved a lot of um, ways for for this understanding of, of co-design and, and really not making assumptions um, because that lived experience is critical to getting it right. Um, yeah. What is what is your perspective on 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 that design approach um, and how it's transformed over time? Yeah, I mean, I actually wrote an, an article just recently for Forbes, the last article, actually. I said, um, I think we have to rethink the maxim, nothing about us without us, and really think about it. Maybe it should be nothing without us. Because the fact of the matter is, we are a global society. People with disabilities are 20% of the population, of the global population, and is only continuing to grow. And rather than saying nothing about us without us, which is a wonderful statement, it was, you know, listen, that came out and sort of formulated in the sort of early 1990s from South African disability rights activists and sort of was the clarion call. And I think still needs to continue to be the clarion call. But if I think you reframe the model and say nothing with, not, you know, n- you know, nothing without us is that we have we as a community have to be a, have to have a seat at the table. We have to have the seat at the seat at the table for everything. And, and why is that important? Because it benefits society. It benefits society. One and two, it benefits the sort of financial and economic prospects of the future. And then there is obviously the diversity piece, but all of this plays into a larger benefit for all. And so that's really the sort of key driver, I think, for all of this. And I think that that's something that needs to be harnessed again. And it it not only needs to be harnessed, it needs to be expressed again and again and again until people get it. With the way that um, you've navigated your experience with DNI, there's how has your response been to people that perhaps have approached design or, or policy changes without consulting the lived experience of people with disability? I mean, I think there's always, you know, the, the word assumption. You make an ass out of you and me if you don't know. I mean, that, you know, there's always that 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 thing, and I think it's important. I, I, I honestly. Look, there's always been this question of when you look at any company, what's the drivers? You know, now uh, DNI certainly has. Um, you know, I actually think there should be an interesting connection, um, an interesting change rather. We talk about DE, you know, DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. I actually, and I wrote about this a while back, and I said maybe it should be called DIA or IDEA. And as opposed to just that, so diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility, because accessibility has to be part of the narrative. And if we're talking about accessibility from a design standpoint, from a programming standpoint, or just accessibility into the workplace, all of those, that element, accessibility as a word, as a concept has to be expanded and needs to be part of the narrative. So whether you call it idea, you know, I sort of said here in the United States, there's the Individual Disability Education Act. I didn't want people to get confused with that. Or there's DIA, which is just another way of thinking about it. So I think that part of the conversation for DEI going forward, I think for the next 25 years, has to be how do you bring accessibility into the conversation? What does it mean? How is how is it going to evolve? Because what it means today is going to be something very different five years, 10 years, 15 years down the road. But it needs to be part of the larger conversation. And I think if that becomes part of the larger conversation for companies, they have to say, okay, well, okay, how do we monetize this? How do we use this both internally and externally? When, when we think about internally, there's management strategies, there's talent management, there's hiring practices, there's even design of internally in the office and externally if you're working from home. So what, what does the sort of virtual workforce look like and how does accessibility play a role um, in that process? This is going to be very interesting. Because I think that there's because there's new avenues for for um, this sort of 
disability economy to play an enormous role in how we look at the culture of work and the culture of business moving forward. I like that idea of a new acronym. Um, yeah. And I, I, we've probably only got time for one more question slash half a question. Um, so I, I, I mentioned earlier that we like to sort of wrap these um conversations up by asking our lovely guests to share a remarkable insight and that can range from uh, a fact specifically about the space that you're super passionate about um, with DNI or D I D E A, <laughs> uh, or it could be a, a piece of advice or a hope for the future um, what 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 is something uh, what what is sort of a remarkable insight with that very broad brush um, explanation that you would like to leave us. I don't think it's a remarkable insight, but I, but I always like to tell people, learn from everything and everybody and every, everywhere. It's You almost have to be a sponge because one of the most important things about being alive, being alive is that there is always something to learn from every experience, whether it be sort of the minutia of everyday life I mean, I, you know, I learned from a grocery list um, to just something that's so profound, which is watching a great piece of art. You know, whether I think that one of the things that people get caught up in and in this day and sort of this age of COVID, we've all been in this sort of moment of languishing when we've sort of just been standing around not knowing if we're depressed. And that's, I think, more than reasonable. The last two and a half years have sucked for a lot of us. Um, but now we're sort of at a moment of reckoning where you have to say, okay, what do we need to do? We're going to have to live with COVID, but it's important to learn and important to experience. And what I mean by learn, you can learn from your friends, which means, you know, start establishing friendships again, start communicating, start engaging with the world around you, because that's how we learn. That's how we grow. And so it's really important, I think, as human beings is to connect and to grow and to learn. And that's what being alive is about. And it can be really, again, you know, um, there's a there's a wonderful line by William Blake, to see the world in a grain of sand and heaven in a wildflower, to hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. And he wrote that 300 years ago, and it, and it still rings true today. Wow. That is so beautiful. Um, and I, I think it's such, a, it's such a, a, a sound piece of advice in a space that we are going to make mistakes. I think as you navigate trying to understand the, the forever shifting landscape of accessibility and inclusion um, and technology in general, that, that you, you have to – be open to learning um, and we learn the most through our mistakes. And yeah. I, I think there's something in that for, for those entering. And I, and I suppose you, you, you would have, ex you must have experienced this in your work with people navigating this disability um, economy as well. Yeah. Mistakes are part of the, the, the you know, I, anybody who doesn't make mistakes are full of it. You know, the fact of the matter is it's par for the course, but that's okay. You know, that's part of growth. And I always say to people, it, you know, look, you don't, perfectionism doesn't exist. And that's what companies fear is that they're going to they're gonna do it wrong. No, you don't strive for perfection. You strive for excellence. And when you strive for excellence, there's a grow, you know, there's a learning curve and growth has to happen. So just focus on that. And we'll deal with that level of perfectionism because it doesn't exist. And that's okay. So let's go through the growing pains together. Brilliant. Make sure you subscribe or hit follow to not miss another Remarkable Insights episode. <laughs>